Good morning, Grace Bible Church. Hey, if you guys want to make your way back to your seats, if you guys would like to stand with us, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, let's start a, yeah, or, or Neil, do whatever. Let's start worship. One, two, three, Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We are glad that you're here today. If you're visiting today, of course, a special welcome to you. There are two Sunday morning Bible studies, and there's a kids' Bible time that began today, and it's not too late to sign up for these. James Jost has uh, his Bible study in that room. We are out here, and uh, it helps us to plan if you'd RSVP at the information table. A couple of announcements, VBS, the 25th through the 29th of July. We've got 26 kids that are signed up so far. Hope that you'll invite your family, your friends to come to that. And you can register on our website. And if you need help with that, I'm sure Julie and others could help you at the information table. Thank you cards. There are two cards that are being circulated today uh, and then also next Sunday. One of them is for Cornerstone and their leadership to thank them for the use of their space. We were there for a long time, and uh, they didn't charge us for the use of their space, and we want to thank them for that, and we're going to be giving them a, a thank you as well, monetarily. And then another's for Luis, our contractor. 
Uh, please take a minute today or next week to write a few words. If you want to just sign your name, drop a $100 bill, whatever you want to do. But we'd like you to take part in that if you would. Everything you'd ever want to know about any of our ministries can be reviewed from our monthly emailed newsletter. You can sign up at the information table. If you're not on them, you can get on our Google group to receive those. And then our website, gbcbellevue.org, will tell you all about those as well. And then screen up front before services reviews that. And our new church app. So we're excited about that. Birthdays today. Dave Schellenberg has one on the 14th. I remember how excited I was when I turned 40, Dave, so that's great. <laughs> Anniversaries. Well, we've got a few of them to mention. Uh, I have been married to Cheryl today for 46 years. So. <laughs> I want to thank you all for sending the sympathy cards. And then on the 11th, on the 11th, Dave and Chris Lessiger, 41 years. Wow. Happy anniversary. Then the kids, Scotty and Tammy Kessler on the 14th, 16 years. And on the 16th of July, Rick and Kathy Vrenikar, 45 years together. Happy anniversary. We do not take up a formal offering here. There are two black boxes towards the entrance if you'd like to give that way. Thank you so much, those of you that just do it regularly through your bank accounts or Venmo. It's really helpful just to be able to plan, to be honest with you, and so we appreciate that. If you are visiting, uh, we want you to know that we bracket our services every Sunday. At the beginning of the service, we take the bread together, and then at the end of the service, we take the cup. And the guys are going to come forward now with the bread, and uh, we would ask you when you take the bread to hold on to what you take. We'll all be taking that together. So as the men come forward, I just want to take a quick moment to tell you a little bit about that. One of the things that we're deeply grateful for in this fellowship is the fact that Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. Because of his payment, he offers us the free gift of everlasting life. And so we celebrate his death every Sunday because we're so excited, because we're a mess, all of us. Uh, not the least is the man that's before you. And so... When you realize that a perfect God is evaluating you, how do you think you're going to do when you stand before him? So there's none of us who feel we can stand clean before God on our own. And the death of Christ was to pay for the many sins we all have, past, present, and future. So if you believe in him, he gives you the gift of everlasting life. Fantastic, fantastic truth. For those of you that are believers, this is a great time to examine your heart as Paul encouraged us to do. Examine yourself to make sure that you're in the faith, that you're walking with him. So let's take just a moment of silent prayer just to make sure that our hearts are clean before him. Should you discover sin, you confess that, you acknowledge that, he forgives you as he always does. bread now. Join me in a word of prayer if you would. Here we come again, Father, undeserving but loved by you. Thank you, Father, for paying for what we never could pay for. Thank you that the sacrifice of Christ was accepted. 
thank you that you offer eternal life as a gift of God. I pray that we will partake of the bread today with grateful hearts. In Christ's name, amen. Take together. A lot of you know that I was blessed from 1987 to 2002 to do chapels for the Nebraska football team. And this morning I wanted to tell you a story about one of those. I was in Lincoln in 1990 and Nebraska was playing Colorado. Nebraska was third ranked, Colorado was ninth ranked. And that day after chapel, Milt Teneper, who was the offensive line coach at Nebraska, asked me, he said, Pastor, would you like a sidelines pass today? And I said, well, let me think about it, yes. And so that, that day we, we did what we always did. We went out through the tunnel, but that day we didn't go up to our seats. That day we went out through the gate on the field and we had this lanyard around and we felt really cool and important. And a police officer walked over to me and I thought, I got the power. And so he walked over and he said, I see your pass, sir. And I said, sure. And he said, you're not supposed to be here. And before I could argue, he said, you're standing with the reporters. You're supposed to be over with the coaches and players. And I said, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a night game, and it was just, I didn't realize how insanely loud it is on the stadium floor. And so watching the game, and it was unbelievably cold. The temperature was below 40 degrees, but not cold enough to freeze yet. And so just, a, it just goes through your one of those colds. So as we were there that night, in the first half, Nebraska scored six points. And Mickey Joseph, who now is the receiver's coach at Nebraska, came to the coach and he said, I can't grip the ball. Mickey isn't a real tall guy, doesn't have very large hands. And he was something, I think he was like two for nine that night. Uh, so everybody had trouble. And the running back for Colorado kept getting the ball. And his name was Eric Bieniemy, who's currently the offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs. So the game at the halftime was six to nothing in favor of Nebraska, came out in the third quarter, and Bienemy again, for the third time in the game, he fumbled the ball. That fumble led to a pass, one of the only passes Mickey completed that night, to Johnny Mitchell for a touchdown, and Nebraska went up 12 to nothing. That's how the third quarter ended. So McCartney, Bill McCartney, the coach of the Colorado Buffaloes, did something very unusual. He kept giving Eric Bienemy the ball. And the enemy would come over and say, Coach, I blew it. And he said, I know what you did. Get back in the game. Get back in the game. And in the fourth quarter, he kept feeding the enemy, who he thought was talented enough to beat Nebraska, kept feeding him the ball. And sure enough, in the fourth quarter, Eric the enemy scored four touchdowns. And Colorado upset Nebraska that night. Ron Brown told me that later he was doing a camp, uh, an internship with the San Diego Chargers. And it just so happens that year that Eric Bieniemy was their fourth round draft pick. So he saw Eric and he said, Eric, what in the world was, Bien was, was McCartney thinking? And, and Eric said, I don't know, coach. You know, it's just crazy. He kept saying, get back in the game, get back in the game, get back in the game. End up beating Nebraska. Later in the interview, Bieniemy said this to the reporter. Coach McCartney just believed in me. He just believed in me. Kept putting me back in the game. And do you know, men and women, one of the things that I struggle with the most in my Christian life is that when I blow it, I want to sit on the bench. If I lose my temper, if I'm lazy, if I talk to Cheryl inappropriately, which I've done at least twice in 46 years, whatever I do, I get frustrated with myself. And here's the weird thing. The older I get in Christ, the more it bothers me. It just bothers me because... As I've said before, when you get closer to the light, the shadow that your sin creates doesn't go away. It gets darker. And so the disappointment is great. But do you know that with us, God will tell us something over and over again, men and women. Get back in the game. Get back in the game. There was a man one time who started telling people, I don't know Jesus. And the first time he said, well, aren't you one of his? And no, I, I don't know the man. And as the denials went along, he got stronger and stronger. So the third denial, he swore. He swore by God, I don't know that man. And do you know later what Jesus did to that man? Jesus said, you're out of the game, you're on the bench. I never want to use you again, didn't he? 
No, that guy said to his friends, let's go back and do what we used to do. We can't do this stuff. It was great hanging around with him for a few years. But guys, we blew it big time because it wasn't just him that ran away, was it? It was all of them that left him. And so what Jesus did with them, rather than to put them on the bench, he, he sought them out, made them breakfast, and he said to Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I love you. Okay, I want you to feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Oh, Lord, yeah, I really love you. Tend my lambs. Do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then you get back in the game, and you love those that I love. Get back in the game. And I want to talk to those of you who, sadly enough, may be like me today. Maybe you've been, feel like you should be on the sidelines because you've blown it again. I want to talk to you about the way the Lord looks at us today. And we're going to look at 1 Samuel to do that. Our response to getting back in the game is critical. Last time we were together, we saw Saul reacting to fear. If you remember, he went to the priest at Nob. Do you remember that? And he said to Ahimelech, Ahimelech said, what are you doing here? And he, he's scared. Why are you here? Oh, I, it's fine. Saul just sent me on a mission. Saul just wanted me to do something for him. And so he said, okay. And he says to Ahimelech, hey, you have any food here? Yeah, I've got some bread here, the show bread. It's done now. And, you know, I sent the guys on a mission. Why don't you give me five loaves? Oh, okay, I guess I could. It's all right now. And then, and then you know, he said, well, where is everybody? You know, they're, they're, they're gone. And, and he, he said, hey, do you have any weapons here? I had a... a 44 caliber, but it's gone. Now, here's a sword. Sword of Goliath is here. And he goes, oh, the sword of Goliath. There's none like it. There's none like it. There's none like it. It didn't help Goliath when he fought you when you were walking with God. But now there's none like it because he's unspiritual now. And then he goes to Gath, where Goliath was from. Gath was Goliath's hometown. And when he goes to Gath, while he's there, he's so terrified of the enemies he had single-handedly defeated their greatest giant. He was so afraid of him. When he goes to Gath, he acts like he's crazy. He starts drooling on his beard, scratching on the doorpost. Uh, thought he was crazy. Left him alone. He wrote Psalm 34, a psalm of faith, trust. But what God does often, men and women, he'll put you in situations to exert pressure on you to bring you back home. So a diamond is just a piece of charcoal that handles stress exceedingly well. But moving on, haven't got it, Paul. Moving on, pressure will either make you a diamond or, I like that song, by the way, in the movie. Moving on, it's not working, Paul. It's not responding. Why don't you do it for me if you would? Or it's going to turn you into a piece of coal and you're going to collapse. You're going to get burned up. So what we want to look at today is, first, time we want to talk about God exerting pressure on your life because what God wants to do, he wants to make you into a diamond. You know, just like Robin Williams found out when he did the movie, A Diamond in the Rough, right? So God will exert pressure on us to bring him back. You ever had that happen where you're away from the Lord and God brings you back? Let's take a look at 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at chapter 22 here. Here it goes. Here's what he says. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave at Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. So they go to the cave, and look at what happens. While he's there, look what happens. Look who comes to him. I don't know what you're in. By the way, there are large cages like this that can accommodate hundreds of people in this area. And all his father's house goes down, and everyone, watch this carefully, Everyone who is in distress, hi, Paul, would you like this? Say, say hi to Paul, would you please? Okay, did I, do, I think I blew it, didn't I? I blew it. Okay, my fault. Okay, so, Paul, you are so talented in your ability to do that. Yeah, good job, Paul. One of the few times it's not Paul's fault. Well, Julie told me that. Uh, I was a, so he became, watch this. Everyone who was in debt, everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. How'd you like a congregation like that? God's, God's doing something with this. But all these people who were in trouble came down to him when he was at the cave, including his family. David, of course, is concerned. He's got other things on his mind. He became captain over about 400. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because do you remember Ruth the Moabitess? Y'all know about Ruth? Ruth was his great-grandmother. 
So it makes sense. He's going to go to Moab because this is family. And he says, hey, would you take care of the family? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what God's going to do. Would you take care of them? So the king agrees to do that. And also he's kind of making an alliance for, a, uh, for later on. And then it says David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother come here. Takes care of them. So then verse 4, he brought them before the king of Moab. They dwelt there all the time David was in the stronghold. So the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, depart, and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest at Hereth. So David gets another prophet. And we want to make a few points in your notes here. One is, if you make a mistake, don't blame the video guy. That's number one. Number two, <laughs> be humble enough to admit your faults. Number two, David's family comes to him. Hundreds of men and their families come to him. David does the right thing, takes care of mom and dad. God is preparing David. Do you know that when, we, when you're in ministry, sometimes you deal with interesting personalities. Sometimes it's your pastor, but sometimes the pastor has to deal with a whole bunch of different kinds of people. God is preparing David to lead the nation. If you notice, the people who are coming to him are not ideal. Why does the text tell us why does it tell us the kind of people these were? Because God is continuing to get David ready to be king over the nation. Now David's willing to listen to godly counsel. Before, he wasn't. Now David's willing to listen. God puts pressure on you so that you'll listen. Because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to who, men and women? The humble. That's right. So let's go on. Let's talk about this. Thank you, Paul, for your help. When Saul heard that David and his men who were with him had been discovered... Now Paul was staying in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand and all his servants standing about him. Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me. If you ever take psychology, this guy is classic case. There's no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse and there's not one of you who is sorry for me or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is to this day. Where in the world would he get that idea? Saul is paranoid. Saul is a guy who acts schizophrenically. But if you remember, Saul was a man who started being engaged in sin. Do you remember way back when? And he showed that insecurity hiding behind the luggage. And gradually in the book what we've seen is that grows. That grows. When you don't check sin, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. And he's experiencing mental problems because of it. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub. And all his father's house, and the priests who were in Nob, and they all came to the king, and Saul said, Here now, you son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? Why have you done this? You and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is to this day. I have a question for you. Is what Saul just said completely wrong? There are very dangerous times in our lives, men and women. There are very dangerous times when you hear things that are partially true. And you know what's true? The truth, not the half-truth. And we're living in a world today of half-truths. So Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is among all your servants that is as faithful as David? Did I help him? Sure. Look what this guy's done. He's the king's son. He's your son-in-law. He's in your family who goes at your beat, does what you tell him to do, and is honorable in your house. All this is David's done for you. But then notice on the third point, because he did give him provisions and he did give him the sword. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Far be it from me. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to any in the house of my father. For your servant knew nothing of all this little or much. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Let's talk about this. Very important. Ahimelech learned the hard way. You can't reason with unreasonable people. Sin overwhelms reason. There's a verse, at least in the New King James, in Thessalonians, it's translated, pray that God will deliver us from unreasonable men. 
that describes America today. You can't, it's hard to have a conversation about anything controversial. If you disagree with someone today, you hate them. When you look at the ruling the Supreme Court recently made and some of the things that are coming out, uh, I, I heard again this week all kinds of ridiculous things that people were saying this ruling is going to bring. There's lies that are being spread out there, and it's important that people know the truth. But the problem is if you try to tell people truth, well, you're a hater. You know, you hate me. No, we disagree. I don't have any bad feelings about you at all. I care about you. No, you hate me. That's America today. It's becoming increasingly unreasonable. Second, Saul was unwilling to accept God's will and all, the, all of his issues earlier. Saul had a chance to change. And I want to ask you something today. There are issues you face in your life. If you're like I am, there's at least two, three, four come up all the time. And as I grow, and as one issue isn't an issue anymore, three more pop up, right? Because we're never, we're never done with sin. And men and women, I want to beg you something. And some of you especially that are younger, all of you, it's, it's so important. For some of you, you're so discouraged at yourself that you've just given up and you're like Saul and you just say, I want to sit on the bench. And God wants to say, no, get back in the game, get back in the game. And I want to ask you something because maybe you say, but my kids know. My kids know that I'm, I'm not a great dad or a great mother. My kids know about me. They've seen me blow it. They've been in the car with me. They've seen me blow it. How about this? How about rewriting your story? How about those that love you the most be able to say about you, I remember the day my father changed. What about that story? Because for a lot of us, if you're like me, you, you look at your life and you say, well, there's so much wrong. You know, I want my children to be able to say about me, one thing that was true of my dad is he was always willing to deal with the weaknesses in his life. And men and women, God wants to change you. He wants to give you the ball and get you back in the game. You say, but I fumbled. But he believes in you, and he believes in what the Spirit can do in your life. Are you willing to take the ball? That's the big question in all this. Saul knew he had issues of insecurity. Insecurity, put those two words together, insecurity. Put that, that's when you're in your notes in Word. You know it says add to dictionary? There you go, just put that one in the dictionary. Insecurity and inferiority, he knew that but he wouldn't deal with them. He knew a replacement was coming. God told him, I'm going to replace you. He knew that. He would not, he knew the man was David. He says it out loud. You're going to see in a couple chapters, says it again. But he wouldn't deal with it. But God still loved him and he cared for them. And that's the way it is with you too. Obedience is not just the right thing to do. Obedience, God wanted to help him and his family. But his, stubborn, his, his stubbornness has created major issues in his life, and it keeps growing. Did you hear what I said? You can say, I don't want to deal with those things, but it's not going to go away. It's going to get worse. We should learn from Romans 15.4. It says that what was written earlier was for our benefit, upon whom the end of the age has come. God tells us these things in the Old Testament so we can learn from the mistakes of others. Are you going to learn or are you going to stay stubborn? In this case, our imagination can be dangerous. Doeg's case only goes to prove the wisdom of the old saying, consider the source. When you're in issues of controversy, context is critical. Have you noticed, I, I don't want to know if I should say this publicly, the media is not always fair and impartial. I know, I know, shock to your system. But men and women, context is so critical. And sometimes people will say things that are true after a fashion. Did you do this? Yeah, I gave him bread. He doesn't stop and say, but I didn't know he was going. He told me he was on a mission from you. Did you give him the sword? Yeah, I thought he was helping you. He doesn't bother to even find out. He doesn't care. It doesn't matter to him. He's just angry. Context is critical, especially when it's from secondhand sources. Assumptions are deadly. Assumptions are deadly. And, it, and, and literally here. Saul is consumed with feelings of self-pity and paranoia. Nobody feels sorry for me. When life becomes all about us, life becomes dangerous. When the world revolves around us, the world gets very dangerous. And when you make it all about you, you're going down a dangerous road. If you're worried about loneliness, if you're worried about things concerning yourself and your self-esteem, go to the Lord. Truth is not Saul's goal. He wants to win. And by the way, I've done this in my arguments with my wife at times. There's times that I lose sight of what's best for her. How do I love Cheryl? How do I do what's best for her? 
Because sometimes I just want to win. I just want to win. And I lose sight of, of uh, spiritual goals. When you don't have a mi- mindset that's spiritual, it gets your marriage in trouble, gets your family in trouble, gets your friendships in trouble and your job. It's impossible to have a mind that's fixed on the things of the flesh and not see bad results. It's impossible. So Galatians 5, Paul says this, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Why? It says here the flesh lusts against the spirit. A good paraphrase of that would be the spirit sets its desire against the flesh and the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. He says they're contrary to one another. You can't. You can't be looking at pictures on the internet that are inappropriate and walk with God. It can't be done. You can't treat your husband bad, your wife bad, your children inappropriately, your parents bad. It's not possible to do that and walk with God. He says, they're contrary to one another. Why? So that you do not do the things you wish. Sin is our default mode. Remember Romans 7, the good that I wish I do not do. I do the very thing I hate. That's the normal Christian life. What's the, what's the spiritual Christian life? When I live by the Spirit, when I'm led by the Spirit, I'm not under that mindset. But the only hope for the Christian is to be led by the Spirit. So he lists the works of the flesh. This is what comes out of it. And if you notice, there's biggies in this list. Look at adultery, fornication, you've got idolatry, you've got sorcery, hatred, contentions. But look what else is in this list. Contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of anger, uh, selfish ambition, envy. You've got all these sins that we would call our smaller ones and larger ones, and he's saying this is all the work of the flesh. When you see that in your life, the answer is singular. The only answer is to walk in the Spirit. And so watch what he says here. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentleness, self-control. I want those so bad. Against there's no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. If you're a believer... That's been crucified with passions and desires. So the mechanics have been given to you. When you believe in Christ, you download a file. You become a new person. You are, download everything you need to be a godly person. But you've got to unpack that file. You don't unpack it. You've got the mechanics, but you don't have, you're not using the tools. So he says, look at, look at 25. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. All believers live in the Spirit. Not all believers walk in the Spirit. If you say, well, I keep doing this. Why am I having a problem with this? Because you're not walking in the Spirit. All believers live in the Spirit. Not all believers walk in the Spirit. So let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. What you're going to find in this today is this. When you love the Lord, the Lord wants you to love his people. You ever heard this? The greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? The second like it is love your neighbors yourself. It's interesting. He says, what's the greatest commandment? Singular, he gives them both. Because in God's mind, they're tied to one another. So if you're going to get back in the game, you've got to do it for the team. And that may mean your family, may mean your friends. And the king said to the guards who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord. Because their hand is also with David. And because they knew where he fled and did not tell it to me. Really? Kill them because they didn't tell you? Seriously? The servants of the king would not lift their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. You know what they just did? They just signed their death warrant. But they knew it was wrong. And the king said to Doeg, he knew, you're a, you're a think. <laughs> you turn and kill the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priests and killed on that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. Now, the Septuagint and Josephus say it was 385. I mean, we don't know for sure what's right, but it's a lot. Why? Because they didn't tell on David? At least he thinks they didn't? Tell, tell me this. Did they know? Did they know they were supposed to tell? No. The Bible tells us they didn't even know, and he killed them. But now look at this. Also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword. Now watch both men and women, children and nursing infants. Oxen and donkeys and sheep with the edge of the sword. you got to be kidding me. Did he tell him to do that? Did he tell him to do that? No, he said, kill the priests. This guy goes crazy and he wipes out the whole city. For what purpose? He was an evil, wicked man. When it got so bad that Saul's men refused the king's command and put their lives in danger, it should have been a wake-up call. Saul's not getting it. 
Are you? Things happen to me all the time, and I think, oh, I should have known. I knew better. And there'll be wake-up calls where the Bible talks about, the Bible in Job talks about that, where God will do things to help us to wake up. Even The Bible even says in Job, sometimes he'll even inflict us with pain so that we'll get it right and wake up. What's it going to take? How many arguments are you going to have to have? How many jobs are you going to have to lose? How many times are, are you and I going to go through things until we realize I need to address this in my life? I need to address this in my life. He didn't pay attention to Jonathan. He didn't pay attention to Mikkel. He didn't pay attention to Samuel. He didn't even pay attention to the Lord. And now his own men who are loyal to him, he says, kill them and they won't do it. He should be saying, man, I've got issues. I've got issues. God will often give us an out and we should take it. By the way, why would Saul care? You prayed to God for him. You inquired of God, really? That bothers you? Wow. Why would you care? The guy's really losing it. He's having trouble, and we do too at times. We just go too far. When it got so bad, they, they should have anyway. They point of seen it. Why should he care? Why should he care? Verse 19. Oh, I'm there. When it says he slaughtered all these, I want to make one point. Saul has already shown signs of being psychotic, right? You know someone has mental illness when they're not able to deal with everyday life. Saul has a mental illness. He tried to murder David. He tried to murder his own son because he said, you won't be king, so I'll kill you. He's paranoid, and now he's a mass murderer. Continued refusal to respond to God and our need to address issues can have terrible results, not just for ourselves, but those around us. Some, I know there are people who will not serve the Lord, and they say, you don't know how bad I am, and they're so discouraged about themselves. But, but listen, there's a difference between humility and and false humility. And you can use false humility to keep you from God. Oh, I'm not good enough to do that. I can't possibly do that. And you know what? It can become a, a, a vehicle of carnality. It can become a vehicle of carnality. Some of it's how you understand things. Last week I mentioned to you that if your prayer is becoming an act of unbelief rather than a belief in that prayer, you maybe should commit three times a day and say, Lord, I'm not using that prayer as a vehicle of faith but of unbelief. Now, of course, we pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean stop praying about everything. It's saying, this is really getting to be an obsession with me. And when we have obsessions, it can be bad. So let's finish this out. Now, one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priests. And David said to Abiathar, do you get, this is called elocutionary force. Do you get the sense of this? Look what he says. I knew that day. When Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul. I mentioned last week he didn't notice him. What I mean is he didn't take note of him. You ever done something and in the back of your mind you think, oh, I shouldn't do this? And you do it anyway and later you go, oh, I knew it. I knew it. I've caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Don't fear. He who seeks my life seeks your life. You're going to be safe with me. I won't hurt you. So let's close out this section. David saw Doeg, but he didn't think. He was not spiritually with it. He wasn't perceptive. How many times have we said, I knew it. I should have known better. When we're self-centered, we lack spiritual perception. David admitted he suspected what his sin, sin might bring, but he ignored the warnings of his heart. Oftentimes, we've got that twinge inside of your friends. Go, hey, let's go party. And you're like, oh, this is not a good idea. This is not a good idea. And you do it anyway. Get yourself in trouble. When we, it's, not, it's not good to ignore your conscience. Dangerous. God will allow life to exert pressure to bring us back. David's family comes to him, hundreds of men. Family's got all these people to care for. And he discovers his actions have led to the slaughter of the priests and their family. And he, why? Because he allowed fear to control his thinking and his actions. He allowed fear to control his thinking and to control his actions. Just as in Saul's case, others paid a price for it. Now David's heart has brought him back. Now... I don't know if you know this, there are several psalms that are written about First and Second Samuel. Let's look at one together. So God's going to allow life to exert pressure on us. What's it going to take to bring us back? Our response is critical. So Psalm 52, look at the superscription and it tells you why the psalm is written. A contemplation of David when Doeg the Edomite went and told Saul and said to him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. I want you to get this. 
if, if you've checked out, jump back in because this is important. Here's what he says. Why do you boast of evil, you mighty hero? He says to Doeg. Why do you boast all day long? You who are a disgrace in the eyes of God. You practice deceit. Your tongue plots destruction it's like a sharpened razor. You love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than speaking the truth. All of us are sinful, but it's simply not true that everybody enjoys the evil the way a man like Doeg does. You love every harmful word, you deceitful tongue. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. He will snatch you up and pluck you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see in fear. They'll laugh at you, saying... Here's the man who didn't make God a stronghold, but trusted in his great wealth and grew strong by destroying others. And then David says this, watch. Who, who caused the death of all these people? Who caused the death of all these people? Who caused the death? David did, right? I'm like an olive tree flourishing in the house of God. Look at this, look at this, look at this. I trust in the mercy of God. It literally, it's, I'm going to give you a guttural here. It's chesed. H-E-S-E-D, hesed, God's loyal covenant love. Now look at this. Forever and ever, he said, that's what I trust in. For what you have done, I will always praise you, God, in the presence of your faithful people. I will hope in your name for it is good. And men and women, I really want to talk to you about this because this is important. I did a study on David's low points with sharing with James yesterday on the phone. You know, David ran from his son Absalom. Any of you know that? Yes, a couple of you? And when he ran from him, he wrote Psalm 3. Why was Absalom mad at David? Who caused Absalom to become bitter? David did. You know what he says in Psalm 3? I'm going to trust in the mercy of God. David sins with Bathsheba. And he writes Psalm 51. And he asks God for hesed. David caused the death of at least dozens of people, and he writes Psalm 52, I trust in the loyal love of God. Now, for some of you in particular, I want to direct this this morning, if, if you're like me, because this is a real area of struggle when I blow it. Men and women, David had one truth about him that was stunning. He trusted in the mercy of God. And men and women, if you and I can't trust in the mercy of God, we have no hope in life. Every single person in this room blows it. And I remember struggling. I prayed. I asked God not long ago, Lord, will you help me to know what to do when I fail? Because I know I'm forgiven, but I don't feel like I can see anybody. I don't feel I can get back in the game. Lord, I fumbled the ball, and he shoves the ball into your belly, and he says, get back in the game. Love my people. Get back in the game. David was a man that was characterized by someone who trusted in the loyal love, the mercy of God. You should too. And I should too. That's how he lived his life. That's what this is all about. I know, if you would cause a death of 85 at least, maybe 385, if some of the manuscripts are right, how would you feel? Honestly, get it off the pages of the Bible. How would you feel if you knew you had caused the death of dozens of people by your stupidity? If it were me, man, I'd be crawling under a rock. And I wouldn't come out for weeks. I'd, I'd want to kill him. I literally would like to take my life. And God shoves the ball back in his belly and he says, get back in the game, David. There's people that need you. I want you to love people. In athletics, knowing you're in shape isn't how fast you get tired, how, but it's how fast you bounce back. That shows your conditioning, how quickly you recover. For a lot of us in this fellowship, when we fail, we bench ourselves. I know people that attend this fellowship that will do that. They're like me. They'll bench themselves and say, I'm no good. I can't do that. I can't teach this. Why should I serve in a church? I'm nothing but a loser. God puts the ball in your stomach. He says, get back in the game. It's hard to get the grace of God into our bloodstream, isn't it, men and women? It's hard. Grace is hard to take. But Peter says as he ends his book, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as an older guy, who's been married 47 years today, as an older guy, men and women, I would say this to you, get back in the game. Grow in grace. And as you trust in the forgiveness and the love of God, as you take him at his word and get back in the game, you know what's going to grow inside of you? You're going to love him more and more and more. And you're going to want to serve him more and more and more because that God forgave you and he knows you. 
and you say, Lord, I'm so bad, and he says, oh, I know you better than you do. You're a lot worse than you think you are. But he gives us the ball and says, get back in the game. You know, it's so interesting that, that Peter and the others benched themselves. And when they benched themselves, they were out on the water saying, man, we messed up so bad. We denied the son. We're responsible for his death, you know. <laughs> and on the, on the shore, there was Jesus waiting for them. Hey, I got breakfast for you guys. Get back in the game. Do you love me, Lord? You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Love my people. Get back in the game. Take the ball and run with it. I don't know what this is all about today, um, why this message, but my hope is that it's for you like it has been for me. Don't bet yourself when you fail. Go to the God who knows all about you. The Bible says if we walk in the light, if we have honesty as, as he himself is in light, we'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Not just the ones you confessed in verse 9, but the ones you forgot about. And the ones that's true about every person in this room, you and I are so immature, we do thousands of things we don't even know about. It is a lot worse than you think it is, men and women. All God wants from you is your heart. You deal with what you know, and he will deal with what you don't know. Get back in the game. Don't sit on the bench. The Lord wants to use you, and there are others who need you. We have a great great team of musicians that are going to come up now. And while they do, you and I are going to pray. Let's take this to the Lord together. Lord Jesus, I think about John 13, when in your humility you washed the feet of the disciples. And you told us that you gave us an example to do to others. Well, that's a great picture of your forgiveness daily, because we need it daily, but it's also a great picture of service. I pray, Father, that you will give us the grace to get off the bench and get in the game. It's hard because we feel so bad. We're so aware of what we've done to you, to those around us. Give us the grace to love them enough, to love you enough to get back in the game. In Christ's name. guys would like to stand, let's worship.
sins and griefs to bear.
Thank you, guys. You may be seated. Sometimes when uh, it gets tough, I will envision seeing mom and dad and my younger brother again. And um, last time I saw all of them, they were sinners. My dad will be perfect. My mom will be perfect. My brother will be perfect. I envision them walking up to me and grinning because we're home and we're uh, together forever. I may be wrong. I don't think it's going to be that long for believers and it will be home. And um, it's good to remind ourselves of that hope. As we take the cup today, when you're done, we would ask that those who are on the end take the basket and pass it across, please, so we can put the cups in there. We'll take the cup together as we did before. But I hope that you will always remind yourself at this time that even though you hear it over and over again, that you'll remember that the blood of Christ is enough. And that's important for those of us that are aware that we're sinful. It's important to remember that it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Hold on to the cup if you would and we'll take it together in a moment. Thank you, sir. Before we take the cup, I want to remind us of a reality. The blood is sufficient so that all who believe in him for eternal life have it. It's a permanent thing. It was a complete thing. But the Bible tells us about fellowship in 1 John as we continue to walk through the world and get dirty. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's thank him for that together. Father, we thank you for the reality of the cup. And I pray that we will rest in that. It's amazing to us, and I pray that that reality will work its way into our hearts. In Christ's name, amen. One more song before we close.
we're going now. When you go, go in the reality that the God that you serve is a God of mercy. He's holy. He's perfect. He wants obedience, but he's merciful. And aren't you glad he is? Let's pray together. Father, we do give you glory for your great mercy. I pray that we will never take advantage of it, but always rest in it. In Christ's name, amen. Have a good week.